Follow me on Twitter, at The Roy Green Show. If you do follow me on Twitter, at The Roy Green Show, then you would have seen over the last several days uh, information on Mark Emery joining us on this program. We've seen it before anyone else knew. So just uh, follow me on Twitter, at The Roy Green Show, and Mark Emery will be joining us in a matter of minutes from uh, the prison where he is housed in Yazoo, Mississippi, federal prison in the United States. In uh, 2010, he pled guilty to a drug charge, one count of conspiracy to manufacture marijuana, and received a five-year prison sentence in the United States. The uh, so-called Prince of Pot sold millions of marijuana seeds to his American customers prior to the arrest in 2005, and uh, the sentence was the result of a plea bargain. Uh, I looked up some numbers on, um, on arrests in Canada for marijuana possession. I didn't know what they were. But uh, uh, the most recent numbers that I saw were 2010, 58,000 Canadians arrested on marijuana possession charges, 58,000. And that was up 14% over the previous year, 2009. Meanwhile, possession of cocaine and other drugs charges were down. In the United States, uh, the arrest numbers were 853,838 in 2010. And for a number of years, over 50% of Canadians have supported legalization of marijuana. So not decriminalization, but legalization of marijuana. And there is a significant difference between the two. So I uh, I really believe, and given the vote in Washington, uh, the state of Washington on November the 6th during the U.S. federal general election, where uh, a majority of voters on Initiative 502 voted for legalizing marijuana, not decriminalizing, but the actual sale of uh, marijuana, maybe in state-run stores, and the freedom to consume marijuana. G- given given that, and you have uh, some legislators in some states in the east in the United States, I believe Rhode Island and Maine are the two, uh, who are going to introduce legislation to allow the private consumption or consumption for pleasure of marijuana, there's definitely going to be movement on this whole issue of legalizing Once people start to get going on something, uh, it's hard to stop them, and the politicians will generally follow what people are after. Now, that said, uh, and uh, Jody Emery joins me on the Roy Green Show on the Corliss Radio Network. You've been on the air quite a bit with us recently. Jody, good to have you back. Well, thanks so much. Uh, Listeners are still divided about you and Mark. Uh, Some are very supportive. I've seen quite a few emails that are supportive of you and uh, tweets. Others believe that you're lawbreakers and Mark deserves the prison sentence. Um, what do you say to, uh, to, to to people who say, look, you guys knew what the law was. You broke it. What happened to Mark is just fair. Well, I would say that peaceful civil disobedience is an incredibly valuable method for breaking unjust laws to demonstrate the harm that they cause and why they must be repealed. Rosa Parks broke the law. She didn't give up her bus seat, even though she was black and someone who was white wanted it. Uh, Gandhi broke the law. People who freed slaves broke the law. Um, but there's no, law. there's no, there's no, there's no, there's no, there's no, uh, Jody, there's no equality uh, in, in, uh, in significance I th- uh, between Rosa Parks and Gandhi and, and Mark Emery. Well, a lot of people are imprisoned. In fact, more people in the U.S., more black people are imprisoned right now than there were slaves in slavery. But let's talk about punishment. Anybody who wishes or enjoys punishment of peaceful, nonviolent people are not very good people themselves. To wish suffering upon anyone is wrong, even wishing suffering upon bad people, that's wrong. To take pleasure in the idea of Mark or anybody who has never hurt anyone else being in prison, well, that's wrong. I don't know what side. I don't know that the people, I'm just going by the emails I received, it wasn't a case of receiving pleasure, it was a case of you knew what the law was, you broke it, and so you deserve the consequences, and and then a number of listeners pointed out that Mark pled guilty and the, that a plea bargain deal was arrived at. True, five years instead of 30 years to life in prison. If anyone thinks he deserves 30 years minimum in prison for selling seeds and giving money to political activism, well, I feel bad for them. But Mark, because of Mark, people are allowed to shop on Sundays in Ontario. Because of Mark, people are allowed to listen to rap music with profanity in it. Because of Mark, people are allowed to read books and magazines about marijuana. Mark broke all of those laws to demonstrate that they were wrong. He's been using peaceful civil disobedience all of his life. 
case to prove that laws need to be broken when they're unjust, expensive, and harmful. And Mark was willing to go to prison for this cause. No one expected, though, that a foreign country would come and take him from his home country and take him down into a different place to punish him there. So he's doing his time. He's not complaining. He's being very strong about all of this. He's demonstrating that peaceful, nonviolent people go to prison all the time for these drug laws when they have never hurt anyone else. And the government and the law should never hurt anybody if they haven't hurt anyone else. We're going, we're going to talk to you after the interview with Mark as well, and uh, we're going to talk for about another minute here, then we'll take a break, and hopefully Mark will be calling us while that uh, break is on the air. But you wrote a letter to the Globe and Mail, which published part of the letter. Your focus was on mandatory minimum sentencing for drug offenses, and uh, Mark is going to speak to that in a few minutes' time. But your point in the letter was, the policy of prohibition creates the very climate it seeks to repress. Absolutely. If people get upset about drug dealers, well, they only exist because drugs are illegal and somebody's going to control it. If people are upset about people who use pot and use drugs, again, it's illegal right now and they have more access for it. And, you know, mandatory minimums do not deter crime. When a drug dealer gets put in prison, other people fight to take that position. They're not scared about going to prison. These gangsters don't even care if they get shot and killed. They know what they're getting into. They know what they're up against. And Long prison sentences don't deter crime. They don't prevent crime. They actually just cost taxpayers billions of dollars. And we're building new prisons all across this country. I don't see the new hospitals going up as fast. Jody, I'll, I'm going to Jody, I'm going to stop you just because we have to take the break, and then we'll talk to Mark. I'll keep you on the line so you can hear the conversation. We can't have you on together, according because it's prison rules. But uh, but we will talk to Mark, and we'll keep you on the line, and then we'll come back to you. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Jody Emery with me. Uh, when we come back, we're counting on hearing from Mark Emery from Yazoo, Mississippi, his first broadcast interview, live broadcast interview since the extradition from Canada to the United States. Stay with us. Emails to Roy at RoyGreenShow.com. Follow me on Twitter at the Roy Green Show. We are waiting to hear from uh, Mark Emery from the uh, U.S. prison in uh, Yazoo, Mississippi. We haven't got the call yet, but... Uh, As soon as we do hear from Mark, we will be speaking with him. And uh, Jody Emery, his wife, is on the line with me. Don't know what the problem is. I guess inside a prison, Jody, you never know uh, what's going to happen and whether or not things will flow according to the schedule that they they'd uh, they'd promised. That's true. It is a medium security facility. There are lockdowns. Um, People have been murdered in there while Mark's been there. It is federal prison, uh, so you don't know what's going to happen. And sometimes I get really worried when I don't hear from him. Just It could be anything, so you, you never okay. know. We do have Mark on the line, uh, Jody, right. so I'll put you back on hold, okay? All right. Okay. Uh, we'll go back to Jody Emery shortly, but Mark Emery joins us from uh, a prison in uh, Yazoo, Mississippi. Um, Mark, it's good to have a chance to talk to you, and I, I asked you to share with me three or four points which you consider most important that you have an opportunity to address in this conversation. We have limited time, so I want to start right away with uh, the the points that you felt were most important to talk about. And the number one point that you wanted to make was Justin Trudeau. You preferred Justin Trudeau over in Stephen Harper or Thomas Mulcair, and specifically because of the drug prohibition issue? Well, first of all, Justin Trudeau is a likable person, and I would say that Thomas Mulcair and Stephen Harper are not particularly likable. They're, they're tough guys. Um, they pride themselves on being tough guys, and Justin Trudeau is an evolving person, and Stephen Harper is not an evolving person, and neither is Thomas Mulcair. They're wedded to a certain dogma. But where does the, where does the marijuana come into the situation? Where does Justin Trudeau's um, preference, or maybe not preference, but acceptance of marijuana greater acceptance than maybe Mulcair or Harper come into play for you? Well, Stephen Harper is never going to change his point of view. He never has changed his point of view, and Thomas Mulcair is very wedded to his, but Justin Trudeau was once opposed to marijuana legalization, decriminalization, and now he's, he's evolved to the point where he's accepting it, and he's promoting it, and he's doing it so with enthusiasm. It's not, he's the kind of person who can change his mind, and it's considered a good thing. And I think that's what we need in Canadian politics, and I think he's going to be popular. I think uh, the idea of decriminalizing marijuana these days is, to me, an antiquated thing. It's very much rooted in the past. I mean, we were promised decriminalization 42 years ago after the Ladane Commission, and his father, Prime Minister Trudeau, 
said we were going to decriminalize marijuana in August 1970. 42 years and 2 million Canadians arrested and hundreds of thousands put into jail since then, all for marijuana, and we still are just merely talking about decriminalization of marijuana. I think he's going to go a step further. I think in the next six months to a year, he's going to say we need a whole new system of taxation, regulation, and controlled distribution of marijuana, and that's the thing that Canadians really need. It's the only thing that will address the problems of cartels, gangs, and the associated problems that we've had with prohibition all this time. Mark, then questions uh, are going to be asked, questions like this. Do we want a prime minister who smokes pot? Well, first of all, we don't know if he's smoking pot contemporarily. I've smoked pot with him, but that was in year, the year 2003. He looked familiar with it. It certainly didn't seem to be his first time he ever smoked marijuana. And he's comfortable with that, and that's what you need. You need a prime minister that is comfortable. Now, Jack Layton, by the way, came to my home uh, in, in 2003, in the very same year, and did an interview with me where he said he wanted to regulate... from a federal prison. <laughs> As if you didn't know. And he wanted to... Jack Layton wanted to have a regulated system to sell marijuana, to have it distributed, and to bring back... And it's a quite a stunning interview that I think never hurt Jack Layton. His popularity continued to improve after that interview. So, and, very, and also, Jack Layton was a very likable person. And that's what we have in Justin Trudeau, a very likable person who's got the most modern point of view, and it's going to keep evolving... And I think that's going to be popular. I think people are tired of these tough guys rooted in their dogma trying to out-tough the other guy. I think Justin Trudeau's openness is going to be a big selling factor, and I, I'm, going to, I'm going to support him. I think he's going to be very promising for Canadians. It'll be I interesting. Really... It'll be interesting yeah. to see where this stands in 2015 or 16 when the next federal election takes place. Some of the points that you... Do you mind if I just read your answers when I, I said I'd like you to share sure. with me the points that you think are most important? Okay, if I just read what you, uh, what, what you wrote? Sure. You wrote, uh, what are the arguments in favor of prohibition that justify 60 to 90,000 dead in Mexico in just the last six years, or civil wars in Colombia and Guatemala, or a police state in America, or the millions in jail worldwide over drugs? Speak to that. Well, we've had 42 years of prohibition in Canada. We've had 2 million Canadians arrested for pot, and we've had hundreds of thousands of them spend time in jail. What was the benefit to Canadian society for all that punishment, for all that cruelty, for the colossal waste of taxpayers' money, for all the powers that we've given the police, SWAT teams, their militarization of the police, the surveillance capabilities, all the undercover officers, informants, the kind of police state that we're supposed to fear as a democracy we brought in because of the drug war. So what was the benefit? What, was, what did we get in return for all that sacrifice for all those violations of civil rights, people put in jail. For, I mean, two million Americans are in jail right now, and half of them are for drugs. I mean, we've got 10,000 people being killed every year in Mexico for this drug. Or where's the benefit? What did we get as taxpayers for all that colossal waste of our treasure, for all that cruelty, for all that police state, for all the people in jails? What did we get for it? I've never heard a politician articulate what was to be given to us that could justify the carnage, the slaughter, the colossal waste of money, the prison industrial state, nothing. The police powers that have been given out over the last, and the incredible budgets that every municipality in Canada and the United States has to prop up a fabulously large police service, a lot of which goes well, to drug detection. What there, did we get for it? There There's are nothing. There are senior police officials who agree with you. There are medical public health uh, care officials who agree with you. There are politicians who, in fact, agree with you. But I want to make sure, but I want to make sure that I get the points on because we're fighting the clock here. You have limited time. Uh, why you? The next point that you made was this: Why did my governments, both liberal Cutler in 2005 and conservative Nicholson and Taves in 2006 to 2010, sign on to my extradition when the head of the DEA said my actions were clearly about legalizing marijuana and all my actions were in Canada? As a response to that. What I get from, uh, from, from folks I talk to is, is, look, Mark Emery knew what the law was. He broke it with impunity. He deserves what he got. Well, here's the thing that I think. You're not talking about any, any Canadian here. For th over three decades of my life, all my adult life, I've devoted myself to peaceful democratic protests, peaceful democratic means of bringing about a freer, more just society in Canada. I think my record is, is, is such a wide, huge record, really, of service to Canada, there, there's no other Canadian that has a resume equal to mine. Just there simply isn't. No one's ever given themselves to this country like I have. I have paid my dues, and yet at the same time, I was extradited to another country. Why I could have been charged in Canada. And you know what? No judge would probably have sent me to jail. I could have been dealt with I, transparently in my own country, but instead... My both governments, the Liberal and Conservative, and by and large the Canadian people, abandoned someone who's done a, a 
30 years of service to this country, I was sent here because I sold seeds from my desk in Canada. No one else in the United States is in jail for seeds. No one else in Canada is in jail for seeds, let alone sent away five years after a record of service like mine. So well, I, have you know, to, I have to tell you, when Erwin Kotler okayed you being extradited to the United States, I said, wait a minute, this is the same guy who sat in a government that was ready to decriminalize marijuana and went out and tried to get votes on that basis, uh, uh, Jean Chrétien, Paul Martin, and his then-Justice Minister Martin Cochon. Well, what I find more loathsome about Erwin Kotler is he prides himself on being a famous human rights activist, and yet he would turn me over to the United States, which has been responsible for this bloody war for 40 years, this drug war, this worldwide drug war that's involved really millions of victims. People, millions of people have died over this drug war. Tens of millions have been incarcerated worldwide in the last 40 years. It's a staggering so. So when the argument so when the argument is made Mark that marijuana is a gateway drug and it starts people on this miserable trail all the way to heroin and beyond you're not buying well, first of all, neither is the Canadian public. Seventy percent of the people in British Columbia want to legalize marijuana, and the e- clear majority of Canadians want to legalize marijuana. But that means everybody who ever took marijuana will be on to harder drugs. So that means Justin Trudeau is going to be imminently a cocaine or heroin addict, or, or for that matter, every other Canadian, pre- you know, Prime Minister, Prime Minister Martin admitted his wife made him pot brownies at one time. And the only reason Stephen Harper said he didn't ever smoke marijuana is that when it was offered to him, he was too drunk to accept it. So we've got a nation of people that have used drugs but still managed to prosper in positions of authority, like President Clinton or President Bush, and for that matter, Barack Obama, all admitted to smoking marijuana and doing other drugs, and yet we take it for granted that they're in these positions of authority and respect and power. So that argument is is irrelevant. It doesn't matter if anything is a gateway to something else. No one should have to go to jail for their personal choices that don't harm others. All right, when you're released released from prison... Let's just build on that point. When you're released from prison, if the laws haven't changed and the sale of and consumption of marijuana remain a criminal offense, what will you do? Well, I'm going to, oh, listen, regardless, of what I, anywhere in the world there's going to be injustice over a drug war, I'm going to be fighting that. And I'm certainly going to be doing it primarily in Canada. And certainly if Canada is still under the same horrible regime as it is now, and we haven't yet begun to see the terrible impact of Harper's mandatory minimums that came into effect only a few weeks ago. So when I get back to Canada, unfortunately Canada will probably be in a worse state than when I left. And that's a tragic thing. I promise people if, it, if they don't do their job while I'm gone and make marijuana legal and reduce the pernicious effect, Effects of this prohibition by which there is no possible justification. There is nothing good about prohibition that could possibly sustain it in the people's minds, and that yet if they permit Harper and his allies and the compassionless zombies that are in his party that keep this going, then I'm going to have to come back and I'm going to have to get as serious as I ever was about ending this prohibition. My job will still be the same. And my wife okay. has done an incredible job in my absence, and I'm very proud of her. And so we're Mark, going to take this up as a couple, and I hope we'll be very successful. Mark, I appreciate the time. It's good talking to you. Thank you so much. All right. Bye now. Bye-bye. Mark Emery on the Roy Green Show on the Corliss Radio Network. We have to take a break. When we come back, we'll talk again to Jody Emery. Stay with us. Emails to Roy at RoyGreenShow.com. Roy at RoyGreenShow.com. And they are coming in fast and, what's that cliche, furious or furiously? Uh, after the interview with uh, Mark Emery, and this one from John really summarizes the general feeling. Mark's imprisonment is the most shameful thing the Canadian government has ever been involved in. There's a tremendous amount of support for Mark Emery that I'm seeing. By the way, our phone lines are open to you at one 399 9898 And I'd like your thoughts, your impression of the conversation I had with Mark Emery. I wanted to make sure in the time that we had, and it was limited by prison rules, not by our rules, we would have kept him on for the full hour. We would have had him speaking to his wife, Jody for the full hour and take calls. We would have done anything. But prison rules kept the interview to the length that we had. That was it. It was all the time we had. And um, so uh, what did you get out of that? And I, and I, think, I think there are going to be talk shows uh, tomorrow that will be asking the question, do you want a prime minister who smokes pot? As in... You know, what Mark said about Justin Trudeau. one 399 is my number on the Roy Green Show on the Corus Radio Network. Let me get back to uh, Jody Emery, who was listening. Um, Jody, I have to tell you, I, I enjoyed the conversation with your husband. Oh, he sure does get fired up, doesn't he? <laughs> Very passionate, of course. And that type of phone call is as short as I get with him. Prisoners only get 300 minutes a month. So 
we make that about 10 minutes a day. We're able to speak to each other. But thankfully, this month and next, he gets 100 bonus holiday minutes. So that's why he was able to call in. So, so how does how does that work? I mean, uh, how do they decide? Do you get a hundred bonus minutes because you've been because you've been following the rules, or no? It's for all federal prisoners because Thanksgiving is in November and Christmas in December, and of course they say they want to help inmates stay connected with their families. So every federal inmate gets another one hundred minutes, but that's only if they can afford to buy them. By the way, uh, Mark is only able to call very expensively, of course, uh, because I send money to his prison commissary and because supporters give me money and give Mark money to uh, get him through prison. Okay. Um, when we talked about, when Mark talked about Justin Trudeau being uh, the most liberal and the most open to change and uh, most likely, and I'm paraphrasing here, the one who would be most liberal toward marijuana regulations that he smoked pot with, uh, with Mark in, uh, I think he said, 2003, and it was, uh, it, it seemed to Mark that it wasn't the first time that he smoked pot and that he enjoyed it. You know, that there is going to, there are, the, the question over the next several days, and I'm only sorry that I'm not on the air tomorrow, uh, the question is going to be that will be asked is, do you want a prime minister who smokes pot? Well, and, maybe, and you know what, Jody, maybe that's not a bad question. It's not a bad question at all. Maybe we need somebody who's willing to think about things from a different perspective, take their time and patience to figure things out, receive different input, have a compassionate responsible approach where they're not rushing into something headlong. I don't know. But like Mark said, maybe Justin Trudeau hasn't smoked pot in a while. I know his mother had difficulties with it, and so he hasn't been a huge fan of smoking pot that I know of. But he did say he's a huge supporter of decriminalization, and we should think about legalization. And, hey, there's a lot of people out there who don't smoke pot who are endorsing an end of prohibition for public safety reasons and for reducing the waste of taxpayers' dollars. So you don't have to want to get high to want to end prohibition. You just need to want to get rid of gangs and protect our streets and communities and children. When I asked your husband what he would do when he comes back to Canada if the law hasn't changed and if marijuana is still a criminalized substance, he said he would have to be active. He would have to, I don't want to put words in his mouth. You heard the answer. What did you hear your husband say? And I'm sure, well, I'm sure you, you and he have talked about that anyway. Oh, absolutely. We have a lot of plans for when he comes home. Uh, we're definitely going to take a bit of time off because we've never had a vacation before. Uh, we'd like to get to get back together and have some time alone, but we'll get right into the swing of things. I still run our business. We have 20 employees we manage. We don't sell seeds, of course. It's just a hemp store and a lounge and cannabis culture and pot TV. So Mark will help out with that. Uh, we might go running for office. Who knows? At different levels, there's always a way to get involved like that. And Mark has always been a public advocate for change. He's always fought for liberty causes. Again, it hasn't been pot that's been his only cause. He fights against censorship and oppressive, excessive government in every way. So we'll continue to do that, of course. Uh, when when, uh, when he made the point to me in the in the email that he sent, what was the argument in favor of prohibition that justifies sixty to 90,000 dead in Mexico in just the last six years or civil wars in Colombia and Guatemala? Uh, that uh, that struck home because I spoke with uh, A.J. Corchado, who is a uh, reporter in uh, in Dallas, but he spends a lot of time in Mexico covering the drug wars. And some of the stories that uh, that, that he told us on the air were just absolutely horrifying and terrifying. Uh, there, that, that this whole issue of marijuana and uh, its its legalization, because I I've so told you this before, decriminalization isn't the answer because you still have to buy from a criminalized drug dealer. The whole issue of legalizing uh, marijuana is going to have to be dealt with. It can't constantly be pushed on the back shelf. And if for the last number of years, a majority of Canadians, over 50%, have told pollsters they believe it should be legalized, I don't think that's something governments can ignore. At the same time, you can't just open the door to just suddenly going to the store, to the government store, and buying marijuana and smoking it. There have to be some health regulations and there have to be legal considerations that go along with that. Do you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. When alcohol prohibition ended, and that was done state by state in America, they had to figure out what they were going to do, who was going to be in control, how would they distribute it, what are the age limits. And even now, the rules vary from province to province, for example. So we can approach it from that level. In fact, all governance should be done on a small level. I'm pretty against big federal government making up all the rules. But when you look at Mexico, which you brought up, I mean, I beg any prohibitionist to tell me, how can you think we can win the war on drugs when the entire U.S. military strength, billions of dollars, militias and armies are throughout the Mexican 
country and not having any impact whatsoever. In fact, it gets worse. And here in Vancouver, we're seeing the drug violence get worse. Canada is seeing it get worse. And that's been in step with our punishments getting tougher. Because when you make laws tougher, the worst type of people will stay in the game. When you're threatening to put mom and pop growers in prison for millions of dollars, many years, take away their home and their children and their jobs and their right to travel and their right to contribute to communities. When you do that, you're only making the gangsters more powerful, more rich, more ruthless. So if they want to, Harper wants to get our military out on the streets to try the Mexican example, to try the U.S. example. Go right ahead, but we'll see a lot of death and carnage and waste and destruction and nothing, nothing positive. No, I don't. It. We won't. We won't see the Mexican example in Canada. At least I don't think we will. But how about this? I'm going to get the calls and I'm going to get the emails and I asked Mark about it. I'll ask you the same thing. We talk, we're talk. we talking about marijuana now and ending a prohibition on marijuana, but mm-hmm. there are the harder drugs. And I won't even go to the, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to do the gateway thing with you because we've already talked about that, you and I. Um, but there are the harder drugs and, and the clearly harmful drugs. We've seen what happens to people. What is your sense and what is Mark's sense? And I wish I'd had the time, but we ran out of time. What is Mark's and your sense about ending prohibition for the harder, and you know the drugs I'm talking about, like heroin. Mm-hmm, absolutely. Well, consider that most people addicted to drugs right now are addicted to legal pharmaceutical painkillers, which are like heroin and morphine, but in a legal pharmaceutical manner. Uh, the only people with problems with heroin are on the streets, and that's because their drug is available on the streets. A lot of people are addicted to drugs that are legal, but we don't put them in prison. We don't put alcoholics in prison. We don't put pain pill addicts in prison. We help them. We educate them. We provide resources if we can to make sure that they don't have too much harm from their bad decisions, and that's the way we should pro- approach all drugs. Just because something is dangerous or you wouldn't want to do it yourself doesn't mean... We but would you end the prohibition against heroin, for example? Would you and Mark be in favor of ending a prohibition against heroin? Absolutely. Prohibition as a policy only makes gangs rich and endangers citizens and puts people with problems in prison or on the street. Again, when people have problems with alcohol or tobacco or anything at all, we educate them, we give them therapy, we help them if they need it and want it. We do not put alcoholics in prison, even though they kill people every day, they beat people, they cause far more harm to everybody in terms of the health system and the court system. I mean, there's a lot of bad stuff out there. People can make bad decisions, they can do stupid things, but we don't put them in prison for it. That doesn't prevent the harm. It doesn't solve the problem. So illegal hard drugs are only enriching gangs and causing a lot of misery amongst people on the street. Now consider also that cocaine is not really a drug of choice of people on the street and homeless. Tons and tons of cocaine are used by high-profile executives and even politicians, Raheem Jaffer, if I may drop a name. You know, people use drugs, and we shouldn't put them in prison if they have problems with it. Prohibition of some drugs is unfair because people with addiction to painkiller heroin don't go to prison. People who are addicted to street heroin do go to prison, and there's no sense or justice or any scientific reason for any of that at all. Harm reduction and therapy and treatment and education is the best way to prevent bad decisions and to prevent harm to individuals and to communities at large. Jody, uh, good to talk to you again. Thank you, and uh, tell Mark that I uh, I enjoyed the conversation with him. We don't. We we I've I've you know I've told you both this. One him an email and you in person. I haven't always agreed with uh, with you, and I probably won't always agree with you in the future. But I do admire the uh, the the tenacity of uh, of your fight. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak about it. It's not really a partisan issue. Anybody can believe in ending prohibition if they want to improve public safety and see their Taxes stop being wasted, number one. <laughs> Thank you, Jody Emery. Appreciate it. Thanks, Ray. Take care. You too. Roy Green Show, Chorus Radio Network. When we come back, we'll ask you for your thoughts on what you heard from Mark Emery on this program. one 877 9898 So maybe I should ask you whether you would vote for a prime minister who might smoke pot. You heard Mark Emery speak about uh, Justin Trudeau. And that Trudeau had smoked pot with him in 2003. He doesn't know know if he smokes pot regularly, but it didn't seem like it was the first time, at least not to Mark Emery. Anyway, what did you think of the interview? What did you think of Mark? I want to hear your thoughts. Sean is in Manitoba. Sean, go ahead. Oh, hi, Roy. I I just 
first off, I want to say I, I 100% support Mark and Jody, and I think that what's happened to Mark is an absolute tragedy. And, uh, you know, I actually ran for the NDP in the last federal election. And, uh, you know, unless Mulcair comes around, I, I don't think that, uh, you know, I'm going to have a hard time not supporting Justin Trudeau instead in the next federal election. Do you think then, okay, so you ran politically, you ran for the NDP in the last federal election, Sean, do you think that come the next federal election that the issue of legalizing marijuana, and remember that over the last several years, Canadians by a majority, over 50% have told pollsters they want to see it legalized. Do you believe it is going to be an election issue? Well, you know, I hope... Not one that the election is going to be won or lost on, but an election issue. Well, you know, I hope it is, and I think it will be. It uh, it will be a major issue for the NDP because I think that, you know, a lot of young people and a lot of uh, supporters saw the interview with uh, Jack Layton and Mark Emery, and a lot of us came to the NDP, uh, you know, in part because of that. And uh, you know, if the party decides it wants to take a different direction on that issue. A lot of the young activists that joined the party because of that issue are going to move over to the Liberal Party, and you'll see that the NDP is going to lose a large amount of votes to the Liberal But you know what? I mean, there are issues that are far more important in this country than marijuana. Well, is there... And if, and if you can't, I mean, you can't, you can't change your political philosophies just over marijuana. Well... Unless it speaks to you about a greater... If, unless it speaks to you about a greater issue or philosophy within the party. It speaks to me about a, a larger issue of civil, civil liberties, and you know what? It may not be uh, the, the major issue for the election, but I can tell you that it is a major issue for anyone that's ever been charged and has had their opportunities in life limited because of it. Okay. And, Sean, uh, I have to take some more calls. Sean in Manitoba joining us on The Green Show on the Corlos Radio Network in New Westminster, British Columbia. Here's is it DJ. Hi, uh, yes, DJ. Thanks for taking my call. Hey, right? DJ. Go ahead, please. Well, I'm, uh, first of all, I wouldn't be too impressed with uh, the volume of calls supporting Mark because they would have known about this uh, call uh, that they were on a long time ago and been working their list and getting everybody to call in. What yeah, but we, we don't open, we open the phone lines when we want to open them, DJ. Yeah, no, fair enough, but they've got a bunch of people waiting to jump on them. That's how they do these things, and that's fair enough. What, I'm, what I want to say, though, is I've worked in law enforcement for a long time. I know that when the police raided their location on Hastings Street and seized a bunch of marijuana. For every drug seizure, there's a report back on it from Health Canada to document it before the court what the product was. And I'm really curious as to why their marijuana was laced with meth throughout. All that does is make it addictive. They say that marijuana isn't addictive. Well, these are business people, first and foremost. They want to make a bunch of money, and that's all they're about. They're drug dealers. Well, I don't, uh, DJ, I, I don't know about that. And uh, I should know about that, but I don't know about that, so I can't have you speak to something I, I can't um, speak to myself, particularly if we were talking about uh, potentially criminal activity. Uh, Jay in Manitoba, go ahead, Jay. Uh, yes, I'm against uh, marijuana legalization anywhere in Canada or the world. Uh, we knew that cigarettes in the 1920s caused cancer, yet they were giving it away to the guys in the Second World War. and Marijuana, according to the doctors, the medical doctors, it causes deep depression, schizophrenia, and psychotic episodes. And can those, cause. Can, yes. And, and for those reasons, I don't think anybody should call it a soft drug. Or That's my thoughts anyway okay, on it. Okay, thank you, Jay. I appreciate your call. Roy Green Show, Chorus Radio Network in Aurelia, Ontario. Here's Jeffrey. Jeffrey, go ahead, please. Thank you very much. I'm going to go to the direct uh, polar opposite from your last caller, and I think that all drugs should be legalized, and all the money, and just a small portion of the monies that are are contributed by uh, from the taxpayers' pockets to the court systems as well as uh, correctional services and whatnot could very easily deal with the people who do have a health problem. How do you deal? How do you deal with the legalizing? You know, it's easy to say I would legalize all drugs. Yeah. But they, but they, they have specific specific effects on people and they are addictive in nature some are yeah. some are yeah, some are but some the ones are. that the ones that you and I are now talking about I think just by definition would be of the addictive variety how do you deal with making how do you deal with controlling the the sale and creating legal realities 
where you where you're not damaging you know damaging hurting other people like driving under the influence and killing somebody i understand that roy but the thing is is that for every problem there has to be a solution and the fact is is that joe as jody mentioned the problems that we have with uh, with legal drugs the pharmaceutical industry you know look at the problems that we No, no let's not talk about that let's talk about what we how would you how would you deal with it what would you do well, uh, have very, very uh, open clinics that would allow people who do have addictive uh, addiction problems to be able to go. Well, then everybody who buys the stuff would be in there. Not necessarily. The people who, for instance... Uh, no, I'm being facetious. Got... I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, well, the thing... Because you could have turned around and said to me, you know, people drink alcohol and not everybody who has a drink goes to the clinic for help. Right. It goes to AA. I'm, yeah. I was being... Sorry, I was being facetious. All right. I, 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 I didn't see it in the expression on your face, so I didn't... <laughs> That. But, you know, so for instance, Roy, look at the people who actually do have uh, a problem with pain. They, de- they take Oxycontin, for instance, and it works very, very well because they, uh, they stick to the prescription as given to them by their, their physician. You know, then it, and and they don't have a problem. But this this whole gateway uh, ideology, okay. well, then it's mother's milk. There's a lot to be talked about here, uh, Jeffrey. I appreciate your call, and uh, I'm looking at the clock here, and I realize that we have run out of time. I'm going to be listening to this interview with Mark over the next few days, and uh, probably next weekend we'll take certain parts of it and play it back and, and get some more reaction from you. We'll come right back and wrap up the show.